Hello and welcome to the second video in the series where we're going to talk about all the science and philosophy of the Enlightenment. And I'm going to try desperately to keep this under 10 minutes. It's my favorite stuff in this video. Okay, so here's the big picture of the scientific revolution. With its emphasis on reasoned observation and systematic measurement, the scientific revolution changed the way people viewed the world and their place in it. So let's think back to the medieval mind, like we talked about at the beginning of the year. Here's what was the major belief about how the solar system worked before the scientific revolution. The sun and the stars revolved around the earth. So you see the earth is at the center here and then everything else going in perfect circles around it. And you have these, the stars outside of the solar system here are all just sort of in a big blanket, a coat that goes around. Uh, also that heavier objects fall faster on earth and that supernatural explanations like uh, that God did it or that um, there's a, a separate being or a spirit that did something. That Those were acceptable ways of explaining the natural world. So then you have the scientific revolution, which moves to a more modern-ish mindset. And there's this emphasis on reason, this systematic observation of nature, using your brain very intentionally and very specifically to think slowly through the processes of how nature works. And that you look at nature and then try and understand it rather than assuming something about it and then looking at it and trying to make what you see fit your idea. It results in the formulation of the scientific method where you come up with uh, a problem or a question and then you make a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis and then you revise that hypothesis and you make sure you have data in there. Um, and during this time, scientific knowledge expands significantly and it starts us on the trajectory, the path that leads us to where we are now with science and technology. So here's the pioneers of the scientific revolution. And I'm going to read through them quickly here, and then we're going to cover them more in depth on their own slides. But there's Nicholas Copernicus, who developed the heliocentric theory. There's Johannes Kepler, who developed planetary motion. Galileo Galilei, he used the telescope to support heliocentric theory. Isaac Newton formulated the law of gravity. And William Harvey discovered the circulation of blood. So you got, boom, these are the ones on the SOL. There are lots more. And it's, there are women involved too, but eh, it's the SOL. So... Here's Copernicus's heliocentric theory. So let's boop, boop, boop. Medieval mind, Earth at the center. Everything else goes around it. Copernicus had this idea where, oh, hey, it makes more sense based on the observations that uh, I'm using um, that the sun would be at the center. That's why we see, you know, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They do all this weird movement around in the sky. Instead of just going in a straight line when you watch them in the night sky, they actually sort of do an odd loopy bit where they kind of wander around a little bit in the sky. And he thought that you could explain that better if the sun was at the center of the universe and everything else revolved around it. And we'll go into more depth on that in class. So Kepler then supported this Copernican idea and showed specifically how it might work. And he found that it wasn't just perfect circles um, that the planets went in, but it was actually ellipses. So here's the thing. See how it's not a perfect circle here as Mars and Earth are going around the Sun. They're actually slightly elongated, they're sort of flattened out. And because they're going at different speeds, he found, that's why you see Mars sort of wander around. And these are the points in which you would see Mars during different times of the year. So it's fascinating work and really, really complicated and really cool math comes out of it. But let's head back. So he found that they were ellipses, not perfect circles, which broke down a lot of barriers because everyone thought that the universe was perfect outside of the earth and just the earth was all messed up. But everything else was perfect. Turns out, nope, flattened circles. So Galileo, he uh, created a lot of telescopes. He was obsessed with this uh, new technology of telescope making and so he took it and improved on it significantly. Um, managed to get his best telescope up to magnifying 30 times. So here's what a full moon looks like with no magnification just to compare it to what 30 times that magnification looks like. So if you'd your whole life only seen this up in the night sky, think about what being able to see this showed. It showed specifically that the moon was not a perfect sphere, that it had all these dents and craters in it, which also helped break down this idea that outside of the Earth, everything was perfect. So Isaac Newton um, then developed this law of gravity. Everyone knew that things fall to the Earth. That's not new. But what he found was the actual math that describes the relationship of two objects in space both pulling on one another. And this helped explain planetary motion. It's harder, was harder for him to apply and for contemporaries and later to see that in the small space that Earth provides. So that Apple myth, eh, not very useful. But the math is so cool. Again, more on this later. William Harvey discovered the how the circulation of blood works. And he did this through a series of experiments that you can see part of here where he 
bound up one part of a person's arm to um, focus the blood circulation, had them grip over here, which then pulled the sort of veins up out of the, the muscle system. And then he put his finger down to move blood through the body's veins, like actually move it so you could see it, which was really gross. And he found that you could push it one way, but you couldn't push it another way because blood only flows one direction um, through your, like through your body. So that it goes and comes back, goes, goes out and comes back. And he discovered that by doing really creepy experiments. Okay, so here's the big picture for the Enlightenment. Enlightenment thinkers believe that human progress was possible as in improving human beings through the application of scientific knowledge and reason to issues of law and government. So we go from talking about how the natural world works to talking about how humans should live together. And Enlightenment ideas influence the leaders of the American Revolution and the writing of the Declaration of Independence. So these are even more modern sets of ideas. The Enlightenment applied reason to the human world as well as the rest of the natural world, which is a, a bigger problem because the Catholic Church had controlled, and later the Protestant Church, had controlled so much of what we thought of as the human world and how we should live together. Because of that, it required that you have religious tolerance, and it fueled democratic revolutions around the world, and because it was moving away from a religious view on how humans should live, it was largely secular, as in um, not part of a religious view of the world. So Thomas Hobbes is the first thinker that we're going to talk about, and he wrote a book called The Leviathan, and he argued that all humans exist um, in a primitive state of nature, except that they have consented to this massive and powerful government so that they can protect themselves, that without government, we would just be a bunch of people running around with sticks, and stabbing each other, and it would be horrible and nasty and brutish and short. So John Locke uh, wrote two treatises on government, and he argued that people are sovereign and consent to government uh, for the protection of natural rights to life, liberty, and property. So he thought that people are like, eh, they're naturally pretty good, but that they, they tend to um, want a government around to help them protect their natural rights to life, liberty, and property. And more on him later. We're going to compare Locke and, Locke and Hobbes a lot in class. Montesquieu we won't spend as much time on, so let me talk about him here. He wrote The Spirit of Laws and argued in there that the best form of government includes a separation of powers. Like, think about the U.S. Congress. We've got the, the President, um, Supreme Court, and Congress all set up to help control one another because the Congress passes laws, the President can veto those laws, the Supreme Court um, then decides on constitutional issues in regards to those laws, and he thought that if you have this government that's set up that way, no one part of it will become like an absolute monarch. Rousseau wrote The Social Contract, and he put forth the idea that government is a contract between rulers and the people, and that it's only because the people consent uh, to have this particular government that that government remains in power. A little dangerous idea. Voltaire believed that religious toleration should triumph over religious fanaticism. Um, so that you should just allow people to live and let live with their religious ideas. He also argued for a separation of church and state, so that the state wasn't involved in religion and wouldn't force ideas on people at, with its power. So the Enlightenment influenced a lot of things, but basically the political philosophies fueled revolutions in uh, the Americas, like the American Revolution, and later we'll learn about Latin American revolutions, and France, um, as people considered other kinds of governments and how they might work or maybe even be better for them. Thomas Jefferson, for instance, uh, in the Declaration of Independence used Enlightenment ideas, the Constitution of the U.S. and the Bill of Rights used Enlightenment ideas, and let's take a look specifically at which ones. So natural rights, like life, liberty, and property, which Locke, that was his idea, shows up strongly in the Declaration of Independence. The separation of powers from Montesquieu shows up in the U.S. Constitution, the French Constitution, and Latin American Constitutions. A lot of our governments today are based on this, this basic principle that came up during this time period. Um, from Montesquieu. And Voltaire was focused on that freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and freedom of religion, and that clearly shows up in the U.S. Bill of Rights in the first ten amendments of the Constitution, and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is similar in purpose to our U.S. Bill of Rights. And so those are the things we're going to learn about the Enlightenment, and I hope you've enjoyed this video.